switching topics a little bit, our next paper will be from Keith Rathbone. Keith is a PhD candidate at Northwestern University. He is currently the university's exchange representative at Sciences Po uh, as a visiting doctoral student. His dissertation is tentatively entitled Playing Soccer During Vichy, Sports, the State, and Society. Today he will be talking about transgressive exercises, how Vichy's sports societies shielded social outcasts. Thank you all for uh, being here and um, thank you uh, co-panelists. Uh, so without further ado, something a little different. <laughs> Historians of occupied France, including Jean-Pierre Azema and Julian Jackson, have called the occupation years the dark years. This linguistic framework emerged in some ways as a response to the bad France position, which had been espoused by earlier historians such as Robert Paxton. In general, this dark year consensus uh, characterized ordinary French people as victims of circumstance, cold, hungry, and uh, in fear. While the lack of food, fuel, and housing may still be beyond contestation, increasingly scholars studying the politics of everyday life during the Vichy regime have raised important questions about the role of social networks, civic institutions, and national identities in overcoming these penurious material conditions. No one can argue anymore that ordinary people who were indeed suffering from hunger and cold in this struggle for day-to-day -day survival, also lost connection with their wider social networks and became mentally and physically isolated in an Arendtian sense. Sporting life in particular demonstrates both the continued importance and vitality of social networks during the occupation. Instead of shrinking, for example, the number of French soccer players registered with the Fédération Française du Football Association rose from around 160,000 in 1939 to more than 240,000 in 1944. Other French sports, including track and field, swimming, ba and basketball, experienced similar surges in the number of players. At its most basic, sporting life offered a respite from the prohibitions on association put into place by the Germans. The occupying authority, normally reticent to allow social gatherings larger than a few dozen people, routinely permitted hundreds of athletes to practice together. In fact, sporting events, practices, and matches were given blanket permissions from the Germans, and on game days, thousands of spectators packed into stadiums. Today, my paper will focus on the activity of two sporting associations in the Nord Pas de Calais region. These clubs are not uh, representative of the entire athletic community of the Nord Pas de Calais, but the comparison between them, I hope, will help illuminate uh, some interesting power relationships between the Vichy state and associational institutions. The first of those clubs is the Racing Club de Lens, or RC Lens, which was and still is a large and important sporting club centered on a professional soccer team. The second is the Association Sportive saint bab d'Oignier, which I'm just going to call ASSBO or ASBO because it's easier, um, which is a small amateur team, uh, a small amateur company team. Now between 1940 and 1944, both of these clubs, uh, I would say, successfully negotiated the hardships generated by the war by mobilizing new resources sometimes to, to ends often contrary to the agenda of the Vichy state and usually for the express benefit of their diverse memberships. Uh, a little bit about Vichy sports in general though might be necessary to give it its proper context. Uh, for the Vichy regime, physical education and sports were a means to an end. Their goal was to create a new Vichy man uh, capable of rehabilitating France and retaking the country's proper place in the new Europe. It's a, an effort on the, on the part of Vichy to remap masculinity. Indeed, Marshal Pétain stated in 1940 that no task is more important for the future of the country than the formation of the French youth. To organize the physical education of Vichy's youth, uh, they founded a new bureaucratic administration called the Commissariat General de l'Education Générale et au Sport, the CGEGS. 
whose purview was physical education and sports, the CGEGS quickly assumed formal control of many aspects of sporting life in France. It governed the activities of sporting federations and sporting associations through a new law passed in December 1940 called the Charles des Sports, which gave CGEGS officials the power to control the day-to-day -day operations of associations. For example, at its most extreme, uh, they could close or merge associations when they saw fit which, as you might imagine, resulted in many awkward marriages between rival associations in small towns. Um, but all associations routinely communicated with the officials in the CGEGS, including RC Lens and the ASSBO, and their interactions included everything from demands for subventions and reports on club properties to complex discussions about the moral value of sports and the role of athletic competition in shaping a French body politic. Now, the most insistent question in sports, French sports at the time was the question of professionalism. Vichy officials strongly opposed professionalism in sports, a problem which they associated with the Third Republic because they believed it taught the wrong lessons about effort. In his role as the second minister of physical education in sports, Colonel Joseph Jep Pasco argued that it was in the national interest to encourage amateurism in order to give the youth the taste for effort not effort for gain, but effort for its own sake. On the other hand, many sporting associations valued professionalism and, like R.C. Lons, centered themselves on professional teams. Since the legalization of professionalism in French soccer in 1932, in fact, match, soc professional soccer matches had acted as important public spectacles and commercial activities, and many routinely drew crowds of around 40,000 fans which is uh, quite large for the time. The Vichy government uh, between 1940 and 1944 spent a considerable amount of money to encourage uh, mass participation in sports. The CGEGS tripled government spending on physical education and sports to around 2 billion francs annually. Much of the funding went towards the construction of new sporting facilities, because Vichy officials imagined that each community should have a soccer field, a track, a pool, and a gymnasium. Officials also increased the number of physical education teachers, provided mandatory medical examinations for all ath athletes and all children, and instituted a system of surveillance to ensure the cooperation of schools, youth organizations, and sporting associations. Finally, and perhaps most important for us today, the CGEGS also sent money to the clubs in, forms of, in the form of subventions for facilities and sporting equipment and offered club members other special perks, including driving permits and extra food rations. So to what extent were the clubs in the Nord Padicale region, uh, racing, France, or racing uh, Lens and uh, ASSBO, able to demand access to these new resources and did the distribution of those resources follow any kind of recognizable patterns? Did professional clubs benefit less from Vichy's commitment to physical education and sports? So in order to answer those, I'm going to look uh, closely at those two groups. So Racing Club de Lens was founded in 1905 into a soccer fanatic working class mining culture in the Nord Paris-Calais. The club's leadership came from the Compagnie des Mines de Lens, who directed the club's operations. By the mid-1920s, R.C. Lens became one of the most important regional clubs. It entered into France's second division, and at, that's the point where they built their new 40,000-seat stadium called the Stade Félix Boyer. In the mid-1930s, the club professionalized. The club's newspaper defended the decision to professionalize uh, because professionalism was to them an ouvre social. They served the local community, which brought their, their professionalism served the local community because it brought so many school children and young people to the sport of soccer. Before the war, uh, R.C. Lens, just before the war, R.C. Lens succeeded, uh, to, succeeded in reaching the top division of French soccer behind the hard work of international heroes such as uh, Stefan Dembicki, Ignace Kowalski, Anton Merrick, and Ladislas Schmidt. Not very French names. Um, in fact, the Polish and Yugoslavian character of the professional side at R.C. Lens encouraged the supporters of the club to call them Les Polonais. And within a few years, the club took on a distinct uh, immigrant identity 
as the numerous foreign-born miners uh, from around the Noah Padicale began to support R.C. Lons as an expression of ethnic and working class solidarity. On the other hand, and in a, in, uh, a very different way, uh, the Association Sportive de Saint-Barbe de Douanier uh, also originated in the mining culture of the north of France. It was also a company club founded in 1921. Its board of directors also included the top officers from uh, their own company, the Compagnie de, de la Mine d'Ostricor, including uh, Monsieur Morel, who's the director of the mines, Monsieur Lechevin, who is the chief commercial officer of the mines, the vice president of the club, Monsieur Soufflet, who is the chief operati operating officer of the mines. Right? So even though R.C. Lon and the ASSBO came out of a similar mining company milieu, the clubs were actually quite different. The ASSBO advocated amateurism right from the very beginning, even though they openly acknowledged that professionalism would have benefited them competitively. Throughout the interwar period, the ASSBO remained more traditionally French and locally rooted. Their membership never grew larger than 150 members. On the other hand, the ASSBO, although they attracted fewer working class fans, uh, actively included them on actively included working class people on their board of directors. So their board of directors also included a Monsieur Eugene Delacour and a Monsieur Jean Quéin, whose address is at the Cité de la Gare Livrecour and the Cité des Ateliers à Livrecour, suggests that these weren't um, high ranking members within the company. The differences between these two clubs' approaches to professionalism helps to explain the ways in which they dealt with the Vichy state and the changing politics of physical education and sports. The benefits gained by these clubs through their, through their connections with Vichy can be best understood in two categories, competitive benefits that influenced the field of play and material benefits, which provided a better living or easier um, participation of the membership. Often these advantages, you might imagine, worked in tandem. So uh, the m one of the most important competitive advantages gained, or perhaps I should say retained, by R.C. Lens during the Vichy period was their continued professionalism. In 1942, Vichy officially, the v Vichy government through the CGEGS officially limited the number of professional teams in France to 32 and the number of professional players to t in each team to eight. Uh, so that, in effect, meant that the majority of French professional teams lost their professional status and could no longer pay their best players. Uh, R.C. Lens, however, retained professional status throughout the occupation, and as a consequence, the club had a competitive advantage against many of their former peers, and they subsequently fielded a number of very dominant teams. The limitation to eight professionals per team also magnified R.C. Lons' competitive advantage because they were able to manipulate the rules of professionalism that the CGGS had laid out in order to keep a large percentage of their best players. In the spring of 1940, uh, many of R.C. Lons' players, like their neighbors, had fled south to the unoccupied zone. Um, however, the Fédération Française de Foot, uh, the FFFA, passed a, a rule requiring, in the name of fair play, that professional players return to their home clubs. Uh, so in the fall of 1940, most of the professional players in the north returned across this line of demarcation, a process which required the help of the, the CGEGS, who had to ask, in each case, the Germans for a laissez-passer to give the players the right to cross. This process of repatriating key players to Lens helped keep the club competitive in 1941 and 1942. In 1943, Lons developed new strategies to attract top-level talent. The club's president, uh, Maxime Boucher, he's also the head of the company, interceded personally with the CGGS to encourage the return of, of players from Lons from POW camps, including their top striker, Stefan Stanis Dembicki. The leadership of the Sporting Association also worked with the company to hire new player employees. These new players were paid by the company and drew their salaries for light mine work. <laughs> they, these, these players also became exempt because they worked for the mines. They became exempt from the dreaded service de travail obligatoire. So both the club and the company used their exempt from the STO status to attract players. 
So R.C. Lons's utilization of the STO system in some ways uh, subverted the law's intentions in ways that Vichy officials never could have anticipated. And the results for the club were very clear because in the 1943 season, R.C. Lons topped the tables. It was the best team in all of northern France. Uh, and it did so on the back of Stanis Dembicki, the man who returned from the POW camps to play, who scored 43 goals that season. So the ASS, ASSBO, on the other hand, used their status as amateurs rather than their prowess on the field to improve their athletic position. Since the founding of their association, the leadership of the ASSBO wanted nothing more than to move into the division of excellence, the division d'excellence of, of French soccer, but it always fallen short. They have a relegation system. If you're not familiar with that, I can explain more how that works. Um, so what happens at the, at the start of the war, at the, at the start of the occupation? So, so many clubs from the North Pas-de-Calais Pas suffered during the invasion of France that the CGEGS and the FFA restructured the division of excellence in the North. The new division was to include the top professional teams, Lubai, Lille, Lens, as well as some larger amateur sporting associations. The president of the ASSBO, Emile Morel, lobbied the president of the Ligue Nord de Football Association, uh, Des Monsieur Désiré Verhege, for a special admittance into the, into the uh, Division of Excellence, making the argument that the ASSBO should be included because of the club's ideal sporting image, the special educational role of the club, and its moral mission in its community. Uh, Monsieur Verhege defended vigorously the autonomy of, of French soccer, and he rejected the ASSBO's requests, but that rejection provoked the ire of the CGGS, at which they actually officially accused the Ligue Nord de Football Association of corrupting sports. They weren't willing to do much about it then, but it was, it's, there, there's a longer story to that. Verhege's resistance uh, only succeeded, in fact, temporarily, because in 1943, uh, the ASSBO's campaign to enter the Division of Excellence finally paid off. The CGGS ordered the Nord Pas de Calais Division of Excellence to increase in size by six teams. And at this point, um, you know, the, the LNFA and FFA realized they had to accede to the demands of the ASSBO, and the club entered into the Division of Excellence. Not because they had merited <coughs> it on the field, they didn't actually move up through relegation. They just made a very successful argument about their special moral mission. So these divergent competitive strategies pursued both by R.C. Lons and the ASSBO demonstrate that the kind of professional advantages that sporting associations tried to accrue depended largely on the specific goals uh, of the association and also upon how closely they could claim special kinship with Vichy's ideals of participatory amateurism. Both clubs pursued divergent but ultimately successful strategies to achieve their competitive goals uh, and similarly, as I'll continue here, both clubs use different methods to gain access to the growing number of material resources provided by the CGGS. Uh, it should be noted that at this time, both RC Lens and the ASSBO uh, were not representative because they're very uniquely suited to providing material aid to their memberships because both of the, these associations have their parents in mining companies. And these mining companies were receiving considerable amounts of money and food and other supplies from Vichy to ensure that their workers remained productive. Sporting associations could amplify this effect, however, and that's, and that's what they did. RC Lons, as a professional club, did not receive many direct benefits from the CGEGS, and it's really unclear whether they ever sought any specific subventions, but in lieu of state funding, the company de Mines de Lens agreed to spend 700,000 francs annually on the cultural activities of, of the company, and 200,000 of those francs were earmarked specifically for the athletic association. To give you a sense, uh, a, a top flight professional player would earn about 2,000 francs a month. So this is more than enough to feed, or to, to, uh, to, to feed, to pay a, a, a strong professional side. In addition to those figures, the club also uh, sustained a significant public following because they were so good, which generated revenues through ticket sales. Many of their matches were the only places where large masses of miners could safely and legally congregate outside of work, especially after the mining strikes of the spring of 1941. Matches at the Stade Boyer regularly attracted tens of thousands of miners, 
and occasionally matches turned into uh, wildcat labor actions. In the, summer, in the autumn of 1943, for example, a match between R.C. Lens and Bordeaux became an excuse for an impromptu strike. Uh, one member of the association, Augustin Vizeau, remembers leading a column of workers to the game shouting, strike to go see Lens Bordeaux, everyone to the football match. Thus, while R.C. Lens was unable or, or perhaps didn't even attempt to garner additional money directly from the CGEGS, the continued vitality of the club competitively enabled a lively working class associational life, not only in the clubhouse, but also in the stands. Okay. Um, Time goes fast. <laughs> so by contrast, the ASSBO was able to, was able to, because they were popular with the Vichy regime, they were able to ask more directly. So they started receiving direct benefits from the CGEGS almost immediately. Uh, they received funding to help them repair their Salle de Gymnase, which was damaged during the invasion. They also successfully requested money and assistance for new sporting equipment, shoes, shorts, and balls, which at the time were in quite short supply. And they would continue to receive these right up into the end of the war. So what are some quick, uh, some quick conclusions? So during the occupation, French sporting associations and the Vichy regime engaged in a sort of double transgression. Sporting societies such as R.C. Lens openly transgressed Vichy's laws, particularly Vichy's rules governing professionalism. The company de Mine de Lens used the contours of that law to their advantage. They paid potential stars as mine employees. They technically, uh, and they protected their top players from the STO. The result was a particularly powerful professional team that topped the championship in 1943. The numerous successes of the club on the field, the ongoing commercial success of the club in terms of tickets sold, and the continued importance of the Compagnie de Mines de Lens pr regionally provided a safe space for community organizing of associational life, and as a consequence, helped solidify and protect a fairly unique working class Polish and Yugoslavian identity. On the other hand, the Vichy regime and sporting associations such as the ASSBO transgressed notions of fair play. Vichy put their finger on the scale of athletic competitions, both directly and indirectly, in order to promote their own versions of participatory amateurism. The motives of the ASSBO are less clear cut, but it seemed likely that they were interested both in the promotion of their club and in the support of amateurism more broadly. So um, finally, this is just a small part of a larger chapter that I'm, I'm just starting now on sporting associations and mutual aid. And here I'm comparing the R.C. Law and the ASSBO, uh, but in the larger chapter I compared dozens of other societies in the Ile de France and the midi Pyrenees. Had I chosen today to talk about another region, the story would have been quite different because this is just a unique story of the Nord. Um, officials at the regional level in the CGEGS supported the ASSBO at every possible opportunity because clearly it mattered to them that the ASSBO supported participatory amateurism. Thus, despite the massive new amounts of money that Vichy officials were, were bringing to sports, um, local officials still cautiously and strategically sought out teams that matched their greater social and political goals. On the other hand, as R.C. Lens demonstrates, clubs could operate successfully outside Vichy's system of economic support when they successfully managed both their competitive and communal resources. Thank you.